Very good, very good. So, you know, um, there's something that many of you may not realize about me. Kind of a, a claim to fame, um, you might say. And that is that I actually know Scott Frost. I know, hard to believe. I actually know Scott Frost. Let me explain. Um, Scott's dad and mom, Larry and Carol Frost, were actually my high school football and track coaches. And, and Scott would sometimes come to our practices and, and talk to us or coach us up and even came to a couple of our games. Um, and actually, when Larry and Carol were out of town, I used to dog sit for them, and they kept um, Scott's two um, labs, his hunting dogs, and so I would feed them and take them out for runs as, as well. Um, and, and, and actually, Scott was also the commencement speaker at my high school graduation, so I got to talk to him there and actually got to introduce him. So I know, pre pretty impressive, right? You're all going to be lining up for autographs after, after the service. Well, if I was being completely honest, I, I haven't personally talked with Scott um, in, in probably over 10 years. And if you were to show him my picture or, or try to name drop my name, um, he probably wouldn't even remember who I was. But I can still tell you all kinds of things about Scott. I can tell you about his playing days at Nebraska and in the NFL. And then I can tell you about his time as a coach, as a grad assistant um, under Bill Snyder at K-State. And then he went to Northern Iowa. And then he was a coach out at Oregon. And then UCF and now at Nebraska. And I can tell you all kinds of things about their family. I have been to their lake home out by Ashland. And, and, and I feel like I know Scott Frost. But you know, that does not at all describe the opportunity that we have to know God. There is a difference between knowing about God and actually knowing him personally and having a relationship with him. And the mind-blowing thing about knowing God is that it's not a one-sided knowledge, kind of like my relationship with Scott Frost. No, he actually knows us as well and even so much more. In 1 Corinthians 8, 3, it says, But whoever loves God is known by God. And Jesus says in Luke 12 that God knows the very number of hairs on your head. I know for some of you that's not very impressive, but for others of us it means something. All right, two weeks ago we started this study going verse by verse through the book of Ephesians, and so far we have covered chapter 1, even though we did it a little bit backwards. Um, two weeks ago, our conference superintendent led us through the second half of chapter 1 and showed us Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. And the foundation of Paul's prayer was in chapter 1, verse 17, where he said, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, and then catch this, so that you may know him better. That right there was Paul's greatest prayer for all of these churches, for the church in Ephesus, that they may know God better. And that would be my greatest prayer for all of us as well, that we would know God just like we sang a few minutes ago, knowing you, Jesus, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, my joy, my righteousness, right? That is our greatest pursuit in life. And Paul prayed three specific things that he wanted his friends in Ephesus to know about God or to know in God. Number one, he prayed that they would know the hope that they have in God. Number two, he prayed that they would know their value as God's glorious inheritance. In number three, he prayed that they would know the incomparably great power that they have in Christ. And then last week, we looked at the first half of chapter one, where Paul is reminding 
the Ephesians of all the spiritual blessings that have been given them by God because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. So many blessings. Blessings of having been chosen by God, having been adopted as his sons and daughters, having been accepted and redeemed and forgiven, and our ability to know the will of God and having an internal inheritance and being sealed by the Holy Spirit as a guaranteed inheritance of our future in heaven. So many blessings of the Christian faith. And we saw how these blessings are not given to us for our own glory so that we can be more conceited or think more highly of ourselves, but for the praise of God's glory so that he can be glorified. So basically, Ephesians chapter 1 is a big pep talk where Paul is reminding the Ephesians of their identity and all the possessions that they have in Christ. He reminds them of these nine spiritual blessings of being a Christian as well as the blessing of knowing God, knowing the hope, the value, and the power that we have in Christ. You know, if you're a believer and you read Ephesians 1 and you don't get excited, you aren't thankful for all that God's done, you need to check your pulse, man. I mean, because it is all there, okay? We should be excited coming out of chapter 1 and going into chapter 2. And that's where we're going today. If you haven't done all so already, please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, you can download one on your phone in like the next 30 seconds. If you don't have a smartphone, there should be one in the pew back in front of you. I would love to have everyone following along this morning. You know, I once heard it said that when you hear the, pa the pages of the Bible flipping, it scares the devil away. So, so let's hear some pages flipping. Let's, yeah, scare the devil away right now. That's right. This morning, we will be covering the first 10 verses of chapter 2, in which Paul reminds the reader where we were before knowing Christ— where we are now in Christ, and where God is wanting to take us in the future. And that's why I've titled today's message, Past, Present, and Future Identities. Really what Paul is doing here is reminding us of our testimony. Have you ever been asked to share your testimony? To be honest, one of my favorite things to do is to hear people share their Christian terror testimony. And some people get intimidated. I think it's just the word testimony is like an intimidating word to them. But really all that it is is just your story of where you were before God, where God has you right now, and where God wants to take you in the future. And no two testimonies are ever the same. No one is better or worse than another. Sure, some definitely have more hills and valleys, but that just shows the beauty of the Christian faith, how it's not about fitting into a mold, but about submitting to Christ wherever you find yourself in life and letting him mold you into who he wants you to be. And honestly, I wish we had time this morning for every person here to just stand up and share your testimony. And I know some of you are like, not a chance, Pastor Lane. If we do that, my testimony will be getting out of here. <laughs> no, you can relax. I'm not going to ask anyone to do that this morning. But I do want us to look at these 10 verses in Ephesians 2. And what you will hopefully see is that what Paul describes about the Christians in Ephesus is really true about all of our testimonies as well. Let's look first at what Paul reminds us about our past before coming to know Christ. Verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Obviously here, Paul is not talking about being physically dead, but spiritually dead. However, just like a person who is physically dead does not respond to physical stimuli, a person who is spiritually dead is unable to respond to spiritual things. And what is the cause of this spiritual death? It is sin. In the Bible, death basically means separation. So just like a person who dies physically, their spirit is separated from their body, 
A person who is dead spiritually, their spirit is separated from God. Sometimes I think we view unbelievers as spiritually sick and in need of healing. Well, the truth is we're all spiritually sick because of our sin nature, but a more accurate idea is they are spiritually dead and in need of revival. And I do want to mention you can't be more dead or less dead. So it doesn't matter if it's an unemployed person dealing with an addiction who the world would look down on or the wealthy community leader who seems to have it all together. If they don't know God, they are equally dead and equally in need of revival. Let's keep reading. Verse 2. Um, so dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Here we see that without Christ, we are not only dead, but we are also disobedient. As a quick side note about this disobedience to God's will, in these two verses we see three forces that encourage man in his, to be disobedient to God. Paul says first, you followed the ways of this world. The world or world systems put pressure on every human being to be disobedient to God. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world because that is disobedience to God. You know, God tells us to love him first and have no other idols before him. But the world tells us there are 50 other things that should be more important than God. God tells us to have a Sabbath rest. But the world tells us we have too much to get done to rest. God tells us to honor our parents. But the world tells us to seek independence, to do what is best for me. God tells us do not murder, do not lie, do not steal. But the world tells us that might makes right. God tells us to be faithful in marriage. But the world tells us, oh, that is so restricting. Do you get my point? Disobedience can be led to by the world. The second force that encourages disobedience to God's will is the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. This is talking about spiritual warfare and is really, we'll cover this in Ephesians chapter 6. But the devil and his legion of demons are at work in this world. Now Satan is not omnipresent like God. So he can't be everywhere all the time, but you better believe he is at work in this world trying to encourage disobedience, trying to pull us away from God. And the main way he does this is through lies, through deceit. If God tells us we have hope in him, the devil will try to get us to believe you are in a hopeless situation and you just need to give up. If God tells us we have value being made in his image, Satan will try to get you to believe that you aren't good enough, you aren't pretty enough, you aren't talented enough, you aren't educated enough. If God tells us we have power in and through him, Satan will try to get you to believe that you are powerless against the sin in your life. And finally, the third force that encourages disobedience to the will of God is the flesh. Paul says, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. When Paul says the flesh, he's not referring to our physical bodies, but rather our fallen sin nature that we are born with. Now, you, I know that you all think that my son and daughter are just little angels, but they were born with a sin nature, and I see it come out all the time. Right now, if someone is eating someone, or eating someone, eating something in our house, and Adeline can't have some of it, you would think she just got stung by a bee. I mean, she will cry and cry and cry until she gets her way. You know, we don't have to teach our kids to be disobedient. We don't have to teach our kids to say no, okay? We, we say, dad, 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 
Okay, nobody said, say no, no, no. No, we don't have to teach that. It's just innate. It's part of the sin nature that we are all born with, and that causes us to be disobedient to God's will. You know, sometimes we see unbelievers and, and how they act or what we, they do, and, and we get repulsed. We get turned off, right? How could anyone do that, we think? Well, the truth is that it shouldn't surprise us at all that an unbeliever is disobedient to the will of God. They are being greatly influenced by the world, by their flesh, by the devil. Those are the three great enemies of God. And they can't change their own nature. Only by submitting to God's will will that happen. And I don't point this out to excuse sinful behavior, but to help us understand where someone without Christ is at in their life. So before Christ, we are dead, we are disobedient, and thirdly, we were doomed. Read the rest of verse 3. It says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. There is nothing that we could have ever done on our own power to save ourselves from spiritual death and disobedience to God. Without Christ, we were literally doomed and deserving of nothing but wrath. Aren't you so glad you came to church today? <laughs> Should we just stop there and go on our way? No, that would probably be the most depressing sermon you've ever heard. But as Paul points out, it's important for us to remember who we were without Christ so that we are truly thankful for who we are in Christ. And right after Paul reminds us of our past before God, now in verse 4 come the two most beautiful words in the entire Bible when you put them together. And unfortunately, if you're reading the NIV, they're taken apart. But really, these two words should be together. And that is the words but God, right? If you write in your Bible, anytime you see the words, but God, you should highlight it, star it, put a red box around it, all of the above. I don't care. Um, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, your life has a but God. And that is what Paul is showing us here. We were dead in our sins. We were selfish. We were liars. We were self-centered. We were deceitful. We were doomed. But God. Now, because of that, we get to look at our present identity. Verses 4 and 5. Read with me. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. The first thing I notice about our present identity, our current identity in Christ, is right there between the two most important words, and that is that we are loved. That is absolutely the truest, most important, most exciting news about you and I in all of humanity, is that we are loved by God. There is nothing we could do to make him love us more. There is nothing we could do to cause him to love us less. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. 1 John 3.1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. 1 John 4.19, We love because he first loved us. Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Psalm 86, 15, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. And I could go on and on with verses in the Bible that talk about God's love for us. You know, but this is Valentine's weekend, right? And maybe you're feeling a lot of love right now, or maybe to be completely honest, you're feeling a little bit unloved. Whatever the case may be this morning, the best news that I could give you is that God loves you so very much. Then in verse five, we see that we are alive with Christ. Just like in verse one, where it says, without Christ, you were dead, 
This being made alive is not talking about physically, but spiritually. Did you know that um, in the Gospels, there are three people who are actually brought back to life by Jesus? The widow of Zarephath's son, Jairus' daughter, and Lazarus. And in each of these cases, Jesus spoke the word, and this gave life. And these three physical resurrections are actually pictures of spiritual resurrection that comes to any sinner when he hears the word, the word of God, the word of life, the gospel, and chooses to believe it. But our spiritual resurrection is even greater because it puts us in union with Christ. As verse 5 said, God made us alive with Christ. As members of his body, we are united to him, and therefore we share in Christ's resurrection life and power. Let's keep reading verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So this means that not only are we loved and alive, but we are also exalted. And notice that the word raised in this verse is actually in the past tense. That means that in God's eyes, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, your identity is already being raised with Christ. Right now, we are spiritually exalted with Christ, even though our physical bodies are still on this earth. But one day, that will become a physical reality as well. We will get new bodies in heaven. And then verses 7 through 9 says, In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. What I see Paul describing here about our our present identity is that we are grace-filled. What Paul is describing here is how salvation is a gift, not a reward. Did you get that? Salvation is a gift, not a reward. I think sometimes Christians, we get that mixed up. Sure, there are rewards to come in heaven for believers, but rewards are something you earn, something you work for, and that is not the case with salvation. You know, imagine with me that somebody gifted me with a $25,000 brand new car, and rather than being grateful for this amazing gift, My response was to say, well, you know what? I'm going to come work for you at your place of business, and and I'll work for you for the next six months, and every dollar I make will go to paying for this car. You know, that would almost be like a slap in the face to the person who gifted me the car. The car has already been paid for. I cannot work to pay for it. And yet, that's how some Christians view salvation. Or someone gives me a car... And instead of being grateful, my response is to say, well, yeah, you know, I guess I have done a lot for you in the past. So it would make sense that now you're you're giving me this car as a reward for all that I've done for you. Once again, that would be insulting to the gift giver. But that's how some Christians view salvation. Like it's a reward for the good they have done instead of a gift. Salvation cannot be by works because the work of salvation has already been completed on the cross. This is a work that God did for us and it is finished. He said that on the cross. It is finished. The work is complete. We cannot add anything to it and we dare not take anything from it. When Jesus died on that cross, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom satisfying or signifying that the way to God is now open to us. There is no more need for earthly sacrifice. The final sacrifice, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has finished the work of salvation. God did it all and he did it by his grace. And so when we receive that gift of salvation, 
we become grace-filled. So our present position, our current identity as believers that Paul describes here is that we are loved by Christ, we are alive in Christ, we are exalted with Christ, and we are grace-filled through Christ. But there's one more verse. And in the last verse of this long thought by Paul, he actually talks about our future. So if we know where we were without Christ, and now we know where we are with Christ, the question then is, what now? Am I just to, to live the rest of my life just kind of coasting, just kind of basking in the fact that I am loved, I am alive, I am grace-filled? Is, is that what's next? No. Look with me at verse 10. It says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, I know we talked quite a bit about this verse uh, one week in January during our vision study. And the first thing about our future is that we are to live as God's handiwork or, or masterpiece, as some versions would say. Or the original Greek word is actually poema, which means we are God's poem. If we know that we are a poem or a masterpiece of God, that should completely change how we live, how we act, and what we think going forward. You know, the world tells us that we are just the result of billions of years of evolution, and there's noth we're nothing more than just more evolved animals. Or the world will tell us that we are only physical beings. And so our greatest pursuit in life is to satisfy the flesh, to do what feels best. If we believe one of these lies, the way that we live, the way that we act, the way that we think is going to be very different than if you truly believe that you are a masterpiece or a poem of God created for his glory. You know, that's what I love about this handiwork, this masterpiece, this poem idea. Because if you write a poem, if you paint a picture, a masterpiece, are you doing it so that the picture can enjoy itself, so that it can be glorified by itself? No, you're doing it for your glory, for your enjoyment. Well, that's what Christ did, when, what God did when he made us a masterpiece. It is for his glory, not our own. There is no one else likely. You are uniquely created and gifted by God. You sit on the mantle of God's heart because that's where a masterpiece goes. He created you. He shaped you. He formed you, and he loves what he created. He looks at you and says, wow. What a poem, what a masterpiece that I created. And if you have accepted Christ as your savior, this is the future that Paul is telling you to live into. And the second thing that Paul tells us about our future as believers is that God has prepared good works for us to do. And again, we are not saved by these good works, but we are saved for these good works. I like what the great French theologian and pastor, John Calvin, this is what he wrote. It is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. It is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. We are not saved by faith plus good works, but by faith that works. <laughs> The works Paul is talking about in this verse have two distinct qualities. First, they are good works. You know, we can contrast that with back in verse 2, where it said that Satan is now at work in those who are disobedient. Those works are not good. Now, these works are not good because I myself am good, but rather because I have a new nature from God and because I have the Holy Spirit working in me and through me to make these works good. Now, unfortunately, at times we see a lot of evil done in the world and it's supposedly being done in the name of God. The first thing that we need to call out when we see that is it's not being done in the name of the God of the Bible. 
Because he is a good God, and as 1 John 1 says, in him there is no darkness. So nothing that is done in darkness or in evil is a work of God, because that is against his very nature. And the second quality of these works is that they are prepared by God. This is an amazing truth because it means that God has a plan for our future. And as we seek and find God's will, we will be able to fulfill the plan. And that is where our future lies. And that's really what the testimony of believers is all about. Sure, it looks different for each one of us in each one of our lives. But we were dead, we were disobedient, we were doomed, but God saved us, so now we are loved by Christ. We are alive in Christ. We are exalted with Christ. And we are grace-filled through Christ. So that our future is now to live as God's handiwork or poem or masterpiece and do the good works which he has prepared for us. That is the challenge that Paul is giving to the church in Ephesus, and that is the challenge for us as well. The challenge is to remember who we were before Christ and be thankful for the but God in our lives so that now we are loved by Christ. We are grace-filled by Christ. And because of that love, we are now to live as God's masterpiece, doing the good works which he has prepared for us. That is my challenge for us today. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a gracious God, abounding in love, full of love for us, God. We don't do anything to deserve your love. In fact, all the times we do things that, that should make you want to turn your back on us because we turn our back on you at times. But you still love us unconditionally, God, and we are so thankful for that love. God, I pray if there is anyone here this morning who would say, you know what, I don't know that I have that relationship. I don't know that I've experienced that but God in my own life. I pray that today would be the day where they realize that without you, that they are dead. Um, but because of what Christ did on that cross, they can be made alive. I pray that they would make that decision today. And for those of us that are living in that love, that are alive, that are grace-filled, God, I pray that we would be reminded that we haven't crossed the finish line. It is not a completed work, but rather we are your masterpiece and we are to live as that masterpiece and seek to find your will and do the good works which you have prepared for us, God. Help us to do just that. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. <clears throat> We're gonna stand together now and close by singing the great hymn, to God be the glory. Because really, that's all, when we hear this message, that's all that we can do. All that we can do is say, to God be the glory. So please stand. It's hymn number 72.